Hello, in this video we're going to be designing and then making our very own rebar bender so we can use it in the retaining wall project. Well, here's the design I've come up with and it's just using some scrap materials. It's going to be supporting half inch 12 millimeter or 5 eighths 16 inch rebar and it'll allow it to be bent to 90 degrees and then on to 180. Uh, just using these two rollers that you see here. And here's the array of scrap materials that are going to become the rebar bender. We need a centre pin which is about 24mm diameter and we've got this bar stock which is pretty close. The centre pin is going to go through the boss for the handle and I've got a bit of 50mm 2 inch diameter bar stock here for that. We've also got these small pieces of 6mm plate here and they're going to be our stops. And then we've got this rather large piece of 6mm quarter inch thick flat bar. Now this is about 800mm long, around about 30 inches in length, and then finally we've got this 12mm rod. And because we're only using scrap materials to make this rebar bender, this is what we've got to make work. So first things first, I'm going to make my templates up, get them onto this piece of plate here so that I can position all the pieces I need, make sure that they fit, and then get those cut out with the angle grinder. Now when you're using a drill, you should always use a centre punch first when you're drilling into metal. And we're just going to position that where the centre of the hole is going to be and give it one firm blow with a ball pane hammer here. And that will give a small indentation into the metal, somewhere for the drill bit to rest and to guide rather than wandering around the surface. Right, so let's uh, move these over to the grinding bench, get these two holes drilled, get these parts cut out. I'm going to be using a, a basic hand drill here with the hole saw in there to drill these 22 millimeter diameter holes, then take a measurement of them and machine the pin to suit. I'm going to use a small amount of cutting oil on the end of here just to aid it cutting through the steel. Now we need to cut all of these parts out of these pieces of steel plate and there are several ways in which we could do that. Now we could just go ahead and use the hacksaw, but you know this is going to be really really slow progress and really hard work. So I've elected to use an angle grinder. Now this is a 4 inch angle grinder, 100, just over 100 millimeter diameter disc. I'm using a cut off disc which is 1 millimeter in thickness and I'm going to use that to cut my pieces out, rough them out and then um, change discs for a sanding disc to smooth them to the shape I actually need. Now this is a noisy and dangerous piece of equipment so I'm going to be making sure that I look after my ears by wearing my earplugs and I'm going to be looking after my face by using a full face visor. I'm also looking after my watch by covering it over with a little bit of fabric here. Now the sparks that are going to come off this machine or rather off the steel when the machine makes contact they are very, very hot. They're going to embed themselves into anything soft that they can land on. They will embed into the glass of your watch. They'll embed into the lenses of your glasses and destroy them. And they even will embed into the soft tissue of your eyeballs. All of which you don't want. So make sure you've got the right safety gear on and protect yourself. Safety squints won't do when we're working in close proximity to such a large amount of cutting. Here's another quick top tip. These discs are expensive. These cost me over five dollars each and I could easily chew through five, six, seven or eight of them just in this one project. Now the way that you can make your discs last 30, 40 times as long, you heard that right, is take your time with the cut. Don't force that disc into the metal, trying to chew into it as quickly as possible. It will lose the battle. The disc will wear down really quickly. Sure, you'll feel like you're making good progress, but you're not. You're just wearing your discs away. Take your time, go slowly, your discs will last a whole lot longer. Well, there's all the parts roughed out, ready for the flap wheel to sand them down to the shape I need. But take a look at this. This is the very first disc. Take your time and they will last you. But first, onto the centre lathe and let's get some of those components machined up. So we'll start with the 50mm bar stock, 2 inch. Uh, we're just going to face off the ends to make them smooth and more importantly perpendicular. Because at the moment, I don't know if you can tell, but they are way off. We're just going to keep taking small increments off. You can see around here it's nice and flat and smooth, but around here we've still got the cut marks from the angle grinder. 
I'm just going to keep on facing off small increments at a time until we get a nice flat smooth surface. Make sure this face is clean so when we pop this material in it can butt hard up against that face and that'll make sure that it's holding it perpendicular to the chuck. That way we'll get two parallel ends when we face off this side. So we've got quite a lot of material to remove here. So what I'm going to do is put a small witness mark on the outside of the bar stock. And to do that, I'm going to bring the tip of the cutter over to my measurement of 57. And then spool it up. And that's the mark I'm going to be cutting to. Right, so next we need to bore a hole through the center of this large boss, this piece of bar stock, and it's got to take this center pin. Now we haven't machined this center pin to size yet. Remember we drilled the holes and they measured 22 millimeters in diameter. This needs to be large enough to pass through those holes with a slight bit of clearance, and it needs to have clearance in here as well. Now we are going to use the center lathe to drill a hole through the center of this bar stock and then bore it out to the diameter that we need. Remember that's 22 plus millimeters. We need a few tools in order to do that. We have to start using this chuck and this specially ground center drill. Take a look at that. Okay, that's a hardened steel and it's ground to an angle that will allow a small hole to appear in the end of the piece of bar. We have to start with the center drill. Then we can move up to a standard drill bit to open up the hole and go all the way through to the diameter that we want. Now we want 22 millimeters and we don't have a drill bit 22 millimeters in diameter. We've got one that's 13. So we'll be drilling a hole through with a 13 millimeter diameter drill bit and then swapping out the tool on the lathe for this boring bar. This is a long reach bar with a tungsten carbide tip on the end and that will get inside the hole and open it out to the diameter that we need. Now we can't just jump straight to the standard drill bit. Because the workpiece is spinning, we will find as soon as it makes contact with this drill bit, it will cause it to wobble, to vibrate, to oscillate and eventually potentially snap. So we'll put the center drill in the chuck, bring the tail stock up to the head stock, small clearance between the work and the drill bit there, safety guard down so I can turn the machine on and drill a hole maybe five or six millimeters depth. Now we've got a small hole in the end of the piece of bar, we can swap the center drill for our standard drill bit and in we go. Well, now that we've got that 13 millimeter hole drilled, we can swap out the tool for the boring bar, as you see here, and use that to open out that hole to the 22 millimeters or thereabouts that we need to accept that center pin. Right, we'll just take a measurement of that, see what we've actually got. 21.6, 21.7. Now we've finished machining the boss, we can start to work on the center pin. Now this needs to be 22 millimeters diameter, but more importantly, it needs to be a snug fit inside the boss, a little bit of a clearance fit so it can rotate, but not too much movement side to side. You can see I've got it hardly held in the jaws of the chuck here, but I've got it supported at this end by the tailstock and a live center. Now by supporting it and holding it at both ends, it'll keep it dead true and straight as I machine along its length. We can just check this pin is the correct size. If we move the tailstock out of the way, here we've got the boss that we want the pin to pass through and should be a nice snug fit 
but it should move freely. No side to side movement, but we do have rotation. So that's good. I'm happy with that. I'm going to be using a little piece of bar stock, 32 millimeter diameter bar stock, and bore a hole that's 12 millimeters in the middle, and then I can use my 12 millimeter rod. I might have to do a little bit of cleaning up of this scale on the outside just to get it round and concentric. So let's get this little piece faced off both sides, chamfered on the edges, and drilled to 12 mil, and then we can make the pin the correct size and face these ends off as well. And it's a repeat of the process to make this pin that supports the small roller, facing off the both ends and then machining a very small amount of the diameter just to get it round. It's much easier and safer to get the holes drilled in all of these components before I shape them. They're just much easier to put in a vise or a clamp whilst they've got parallel edges. And just drilling it with a small diameter drill bit first as a pilot hole before I open it up to the diameter that I actually need. Swapping out the disc on the angle grinder for the flap wheel uh, is basically just lots of small pieces of sandpaper bonded to the disc. This is going to make short work of cleaning up these components and getting them ultimately to the shape they need to be. simplest way to get these two plates exactly the same size and shape as each other is to clamp them together and I'm going to do that but I do want to make sure that this hole aligns in both plates so I'm just using the center pin that we made, pop that into the hole, clamp them together in the vise and shape them together at the same time. Because these plates are so thick they won't get very good weld penetration so just to aid the assembly I'm going to be chamfering this long edge so that when the two parts come together there'll be a groove for the weld to penetrate. That way we'll get a really strong join. And just a quick tickle with the angle grinder and that flap wheel just to remove all of those burrs, those sharp edges on all faces. So I'm just preparing this now for tack welding together and to do that I've cut myself a small block of material ever so slightly longer than the length of the boss down here. You can see the boss is now free, it spins and has a very slight movement side to side. That means this is exactly the right measurement. These are the right distance apart and by clamping them in place it keeps these two parallel. Now I'm experimenting here with three different techniques. I really want to just determine which one looks the best, and perhaps even more importantly, especially for this job, which one has the best weld penetration when viewed from the underside of the base plate. And I think you can see looking on the underside here that the stitch welding really is the one that gives the most inconsistent penetration. Top tip when filing a radius like on these gusset plates here, don't do it the way that you would expect. Start at the top of the curve and rock backwards and that way you'll get consistent even radiuses. Now we're just aligning these parts by using the pins. If I just put them in you can see how easy it is to get them misaligned. It's important that they're actually parallel to each other. So spend some time getting them lined up before tack welding them in place.
Now you can do all the cleaning up with your metal parts using a handheld angle grinder, but if you do have access to a linishing belt like this one, it really can speed things up a little. So that will allow us to bend rebar through 90 degrees, but I really want to stop on here so I can bend uh, a further 90 degrees, taking it through to 180. And I want to position it so that I can use the 12mm rebar that I'm working with, but also potentially 16 millimeters, 5 eighths of an inch. Okay, the moment of truth, time for the first test. Now this is a piece of 12 millimeter half inch mild steel bar. Not quite as tough or as tensile as the rebar I will be bending, but as you can see, it's doing a great job. Now when this is in service, it's gonna get scratched up and marked and knocked and, and parts will go rusty, but you know what? It looks great in this raw steel finish. And so a little bit of clear coat will help protect it and make it look great for a little bit longer. Now the paint's had time to dry up, a little bit of multi-purpose grease on all the contact surfaces and the wear surfaces just before the final assembly. Now the purpose of this additional plate is quite simply to tie the ends of these two points together. We've got quite a lot of force on this pin at this point and there's a possibility that when this is bending particularly thick or heavy duty reinforcement bar that it could actually bend at this point. What this will do is support this pin at both ends. It's welded at this end, it's now supported by this pin on this pivot at this end. So this cannot bend. But I've had a number of hours work on this rebar bender now just to test it out and see if this prototype is actually working the way it's intended. And I guess the answer is yes, but as everything, it could be improved. And this really needs to be improved before I use it on a much larger job. Take a look at this 12 diameter pin. You can see at this point that it's actually bent, all right? This part is kicked up at an angle. And you can really see how much it's bent. If I attempt to put this plate on, you can see just how far off those centers are. Now, the reason that happened is that this plate fell off midway through a bend, which caused excessive force on the roller and the pin, and therefore bending it. The purpose of this plate, of course, was to prevent that. However, the plate falls off too easily. So the problem is the plate and the diameter of the pin. I think what we need to do is use this diameter pin here. This is 22 diameter and this is 12. So I'm gonna use this to finish off the job, but before I do the next job, which is most likely the workshop foundations, I'm gonna bore out this roller to 22 diameter. I'm gonna remake these two gusset plates so they're larger and have a 22 diameter hole in them. I'll have to shape and scallop this back a little bit so that there's um, clearance for the 22 millimeter pin and that will solve the problem. In the meantime, it's quite an easy fix. I can pull this to the end here, hammer on this quite a few times just to straighten out this pin, put the plate back on, and we're back in business. Now I can do that quite a few times before we get enough stress built up into the steel here to fatigue it and cause a crack to form and basically break the pin right off. So I'm hopeful it'll get us through to the end of the job. Well, there it is, the rebar bender. You know, it's had a really good workout getting to grips with the foundations on this retaining wall, and it's proved to be a really invaluable tool. Now, there's something really satisfying about designing and making your own equipment. Now, in the next video, I'm hoping, if everything goes to plan, to get the steelwork finished for the retaining wall foundations, get the concrete poured, and get set up for block work. So hopefully you'll join me for that next week. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching, and thank you again to all those people who have subscribed to the channel. It's really helping out. That's it for today. Thanks so much. Bye.